Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we learned a little bit this, uh, this last Sunday, and I'm going to extend it, as is my right and privilege, and what I like to do, if there's still meat on the bone, we're going to get it off of there. If there's still bread to eat, we're going to eat it. Galatians 5, anything with leaven, uh, bread, leaven, wine, you take grain, corn, uh, rice, barley, hops, any kind of thing like that. And you to take the sugar out of it, take the sweetness out of the grape, you put yeast in it. Yeast eats the sugars out of the grain or the potato or the rice or whatever it is you're using, the corn, and it belches out alcohol. And that ruins it, makes it bad. There are, and I, I, like to, I like to stress this part of it, the Bible does give limited exceptions to the use of alcohol, very limited, narrow, and I always say this, if you abuse that, that's on you, that's not on God. Um, it's like people who, <laughs> I knew a guy, he was a drywall hanger and his uncle was a preacher that I very respected, brother Earl Ames. Um, I loved that man, uh, godly man, good preacher, loved the Bible, loved righteousness, but his nephew was a little woo. And, um, he would blast anybody whose sins he thought disagreed with the Bible, yet he smoked marijuana. He said, well, God put it on, and I love this, this argument. God put it on this earth. Yeah, they made rope out of it. And um, so if you abuse that, that's on you. But God gave, in the book of Proverbs and in the New Testament, gave limited uses. Someone, Paul said, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. And the purpose of that was... The wine, the alcohol in it was an antibacterial agent. We know that. Sterilize things. They would add it to the water at times to purify water. For thy stomach's sake, he said, so to make sure you didn't get dysentery, which can kill you. Uh, he said, use it for that. For thy oft infirmities, our forefathers would use brandy or things like that uh, as a very modest home remedy. I remember one time as a boy, my mom gave me a hot toddy. That was not good. I did not like that. Uh, she basically made me choke that down. But I was real bad sick, and that was a remedy that even, even the Puritans used. Um, in fact, the first words that Squanto said to the Puritans in English when he saw them was, do you have any beer? And these Puritans were going, did he just say that in English? Yeah, he said that in English. They said, no, but we have some rum. And it wasn't because they were drunkards or men given to drink. It was, that was for remedies. And then in the book of Proverbs, uh, give wine to him. Um, I'd have to look up the verse, but wine and strong drink to someone who is in deep sorrow or someone who is perishing. Uh, cancer patients or people that are dying and in hospice, they pretty much just dope them out of their mind, which is humane to do when someone who is in extreme pain like that. We give morphine, we give opiates to them. And uh, it is a right thing to do. We basically intoxicate someone. They intoxicated Lisa when she had surgery Wednesday. They do that in a controlled setting uh, so that the person doesn't feel the pain of the surgery. And post-surgery, she is given pain meds, although they restrict that now. They don't give you near enough um, for fear of the lawsuits that are going on around. But they give out 
basically intoxicants to help dull the pain. In a controlled situation, that's humane, that's right to do. Um, I know someone, I wouldn't mention their name, but they told me this in confidence, a good Christian friend of mine uh, who battles depression every now and then, um, says, I don't, he says, I don't trust some of the medicines, but he said, I can take a little red wine when I am depressed. And he said, I have the ability when I'm not depressed to put it away. Um, and I think that's biblical. I think it's right. I think it's within the confines of the narrow use that the Bible gives it out. But when it comes to people abusing that, obviously it's wrong. And I've had people say, well, you know, the Bible says you can do whatever you want to as long as it's in moderation. The Bible does not say that. It does not give out that impression. So let's look at the scriptures. Galatians 5, verse 7, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. So it doesn't matter what the leaven is in, the leaven being there is a problem because once it's there, it only increases. It doesn't decrease. It will go through and consume out the sweetness or the goodness. Think of your Bible. With this in mind, can your Bible be wrong or have an error in it and still be called the Word of God? And the answer is no. That was the thing that I pursued when God convinced me that my Bible was right. Was I said, God, I want to know from the scriptures why I believe this. I believe it because you spoke it to my heart, but I want to see it in the Bible. I want to know. And I ran across verse after verse after verse that convinced me that my Bible could not be in error. It could not contain anything that was wrong, anything that was mistranslated, anything that was not copied correctly. And I know all the arguments because I used to be on the other side of this idea. I was taught that the Bibles, that all the manuscripts had copyist errors in them. And you only have to compare 1 Kings and 2 Kings with 1 and 2 Chronicles and you'll see the errors. You'll see mistakes. Why is it that they couldn't get what was written above the cross correct? Well, when you look at all four Gospels and you put, you write it out, what was said in all four Gospels, when you add them together, you get a perfect view of what was written above the head of Jesus Christ. You don't have an error there. And so that's how I see it. Um, I've always said this rule number one, there are no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if someone says there's mistakes in the Bible, refer to rule number one. There's no mistakes in the Bible. That'll keep your, that'll keep your mind right. And I would say to anybody who told you to go looking for mistakes in a book that said there were no mistakes in it, who gave you the license to find errors in a book that God said contains no errors. So even a little leaven in the Bible is not good. Because then, if one verse is incorrect, then someone comes along and says, well, this verse then must be incorrect. Then it gets into a situation of where do we stop it? Where do we, where do we draw the line of where the Bible's right and where the Bible is wrong? It's like the United Methodist. Years ago, this back early 90s, late 80s, they did this. They went through the Gospels. And they published a version of the Gospels that was marked A, category A, what Jesus probably said. Category B, what Jesus probably didn't say. Category 3, what we know for a fact Jesus did not say and could not have said. Well, that's pretty good. You were there when Jesus said it, right? Well, the guy that was said that he said it. How can you dispute with a, with a dead man? You can't. So anyway, there is a, like I say, leaven in bread. God said it's not good. Leaven in, uh, there's two types of wine in the Bible. The word wine 
simply means from the vine. But you have to use the context to find out then what it's referring to. Um, there's a verse in Isaiah that says, new wine cometh from the cluster. Well, if you squeeze it right from the cluster, then it's not leavened. It doesn't have any alcohol. God doesn't grow grapes that naturally contain alcohol in it. Uh, that'll be for science to do in the years to come. I'm sure they'll figure out a way. Pre-leavened grapes. But he said new wine is from the cluster. You squeeze it right into the cup. It is unleavened. It does not contain any defilement, no alcohol. It's good. But it was still referred to as wine. And when people say, well, Jesus turned the water to wine. Okay, what did he do? They said that the wine that Jesus made was better than what they served at the first. Okay, so I cannot accept the fact that Jesus made something that would intoxicate everybody at the wedding party. Cannot accept that. I won't accept it. Especially when you know what the Bible says. Turn to Isaiah 29. Let's get... This is um, a theme. You'll study wine and strong drink out through the Bible. Then you'll, you'll understand there's two types. There is the physical beverage that people would drink. There is also a, an intoxicating spirit. A spirit that when it comes upon you, it makes you spiritually drunk what are the symptoms of someone who is under the influence of a spirit same as what somebody would be under the influence of wine and strong drink they can't see straight they can't think straight they can't stand straight can't walk can't talk what do the, what do cops look for when they pull somebody over they want that why do they want the window down to smell inside the vehicle and the courts have ruled that's not an illegal search. It, the vapors escaped. You can smell it. Obviously, now they have a reason. So they look for the strong smell of, an, of alcohol. They listen to the person's speech. Is their speech slurred? Are their emotions agitated? Because someone who is intoxicated does not control their emotions. They're either overjoyed over depressed or over angry, easily agitated. Um, can they walk a straight line? Can they hold their foot six inches up? Can they follow instructions? Can you start the alphabet at the letter K and move forward? Things like that. Things that we would be able to say, okay, K L M N O P Q R S without singing it. But a drunk person, they'll they'll they can't do it. They can't go from nothing to the middle of the alphabet and move forward. They can't do it. So there's clues that people who are intoxicated spiritually, that they possess. Isaiah 29, verse 9. Stay yourselves in wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Verse 10 is the key. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. It is a spirit that causes people to be put to sleep spiritually. Even though they may be awake, they may be driving their car okay, but the things that they think about God are not correct. The things that they think about Jesus are not right. The things that they say about Bible doctrine is amiss. It does not follow the straight line of Scripture. It, their ways are crooked like a snake. Snakes do not extend themselves in a straight line and move straight forward. God designed them to where they slur when they move about. Crooked. The Lord hath poured upon you the spirit of deep sleep and it closed your eyes. So they can't see the Bible for what it is. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. The people that we count on to tell us about God, tell us about Jesus, tell us about salvation, tell us about right things. We cannot count on them because their eyes are closed. 
Their mind and their spirit is drunken. They do not comprehend. They do not understand. And they speak in dark sentences. They speak in mysteries. I do not understand this. Therefore, you won't understand it. The seers hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Think about that. Which men deliver to one that has learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that has not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. So, when it, God is establishing this idea that wine, strong drink in the Bible indicate false doctrine, not understanding, not knowing, not being able to see, not being able to comprehend, then not being able to teach it correctly. What did God give Moses that caused him to not be easily understood? He was a stutterer, a stammerer. With stammering lips, God said, and another tongue will he speak to this people. So that's, what Mo that's why Moses said, God, why me? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm hard of speech, he said. So God said, fine, I'll send Aaron with you and he shall speak for you so they can be understood. So that's a, what that is. It's a symbol. Those who put their faith and their trust in Moses and what Moses said will not understand God. They will not understand doctrine. They will not understand grace. They will not understand salvation to them. It's all about keeping the law or pretending to keep the law, which no one's ever done. So in that sense. Their eyes have been covered. The Bible says the veil is over them. When they read the Old Testament, they cannot understand what it is. So they read the Bible. And they cannot comprehend it. They say it's sealed. They say it's a mystery. They say it's not to be understood. So understand that idea. When, when people go wrong scripturally, I had a, um, an article sent to me. Somebody asked me about it. And I went and looked at the article. Then I went and looked at who wrote it. What, what else do they believe? There was things about the article that did not make sense to me. I did not. I'm just going, number one, I don't see any evidence of what this person is saying is right. It was a conspiracy theory. And that's all it was. It was a made up theory. Had no backing whatsoever. No scripture whatsoever. So then I went to find out what this guy believed. So he puts out an article and he states in there that when you die, your misunderstanding is that you go to heaven. He said, no one goes to heaven. That's a misunderstanding. That's a complete, men have made that doctrine up. And I'm going, really? Really? Where do we go? His idea was they lay in the grave. So when I presented that to the person who sent me the article, he said, I, I'm sorry for, I said, no, don't worry about it. People make mistakes. I make them all the time. But why would he say, I've heard people say that Jesus is not the bridegroom. We're not the bride. We don't go to heaven when we die. Things like that. Or hell is the grave. You just lay there and you're dead and that's the end of it. If that's the end of it, what are we doing here? What are we fighting for? What are we standing up for? What are we living for? If all there is is just the grave and we go into it and we die and that's it. And God does not punish the, the unrighteous. Then what teeth does the law have? has none. If you can't enforce it upon those who break it, then what good is it? Why is it there? So all of these things are false doctrines and people who have a drunken spirit. If you believe the truth and you believe the Bible and you know what it says, you ought to get down on your face before God and thank him for not turning you over to a reprobate mind. Because I'm going to preach this morning about the difference between charity and knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. And if we're not careful with what we believe and what God has given us, we'll be too arrogant for God to use. We'll be bloated. It'll be about us and whether we were right instead of loving people. If you love people, you won't riot. Amen? If, if these people are trying to get sympathy over the wrongful... It was wrong that this man was killed. It was wrong. But if they're trying to garner sympathy and change 
by burning down people's businesses, by destroying police offices. If that's what they're attempting, they get no sympathy from me. A soft answer would be better. Turneth away wrath, the Bible says. Amen? That's what the Bible says. I'm going to preach it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 20. See if I got a Tootsie Roll in here. Proverbs 20. <clears throat> Verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. There are different types of drunks. With some... They're lovers. When they get drunk, I love you, man. I love you. And you're just going, oh my goodness. But then, with some people, there's a boxing glove in every bottle. A sword in every bottle. They get drunk. They want to fight. They want to argue. Um, I will say... The man that they were arresting in Minnesota was drunk. He was very drunk. Um, that was based upon the 911 call that came in. They released the transcript of the 911 call. The guy who called it in said he was passing off fake bills. That's not an offense punishable by death. Not saying that. But the store clerk said this man was very drunk when he came in, bought cigarettes with fake bills. So he called the police. Um, did the alcohol contribute at least to the arrest? Yes. Um, because most drunk people who get arrested don't want to be arrested. And they fight. I don't know that this man did that. Um, so I'm not justifying the use of the force that they used. That was blatantly wrong. Um, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So notice what the, the verse is telling you. It's telling you there's deception in strong drink and foolishness, the lack of wisdom. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So Kenneth Hagin, Rodney Howard Brown, Kenneth Copeland, these types... Tell everybody you get drunk in the spirit. The spirit of God makes you act like a drunk person. Um, there is a video. I've talked about it years ago. Kenneth Hagin, he's up at Life Christian Center back before it became Faith Church. And um, he's there touching everybody and they're acting. I think most of it's an act. They were acting drunk. They would be falling down, laughing hysterically. Men laying on top of women, women laying on top of men in a big pile. That's lasciviousness, that's wrong, that's wicked, that the Holy Ghost is never going to do anything like that. And he justified it by saying drunks fall down. So people would fall down when he would touch them or he would blow upon them or whatever it was. And then he altered the scripture and that's what drunks do. They change the rules. So he started to quote the verse of scripture where Paul's telling Timothy, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled. And then he added the words, be drunk in the spirit. He added the words, be drunk. When he said, be filled with the spirit, he added, be drunk. So his concept was, if you are really full of the spirit, you will laugh hysterically, you will fall down, you will not be able to stand. So we're told in the Bible, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you're drunk, you cannot know the adversary. You will not know the lion. There's a lion of Judah and there's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Which is which? You will not be able to tell the difference. 
They offered Israel a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. They brought Barabbas, a murderer, a thief, a zealot out of prison, stood him up there and said, make your choice. And they said, crucify Jesus, give us Barabbas. A spirit of drunkenness and darkness had fallen upon them. They could not choose the right Messiah. They chose the wrong one. And I submit to you that because of people's lack of knowledge, their lack of knowing what the Bible says, their lack of knowing simple doctrines from the Bible, they will turn to false doctrines. They will turn to a spirit of drunkenness. Um, I've mentioned to you somebody out of this church now heading up a church of Sabbath keepers, law keepers. We keep the Passover. We're keeping the feast. We're keeping the dietary laws. We're keeping the Sabbath. We're keeping the law because that's what pleases God. God wants us to keep the law. You're not, and he's, they, he speaks double-minded and double-tongued. Yes, I believe in grace, but you must also keep the law. You can't have both. And you're not saved by both. What happens when you're drunk? You see double. And that's what he's seeing. He's seeing the two covenants merge together to create a fantasy salvation that puffs themselves up because of what they do versus, I guess, us or any others who don't do what they do. And that was the whole purpose. The Apostle Paul telling us that we're not saved by works because if you're saved by works, you'll boast about those works. And that's what they do. They boast themselves over above those who they say don't keep the law like they do. Turn to Leviticus chapter 10. Notice what God was saying here. And I, at one time, have been guilty of this very thing. Not being able to see the difference between sacred and profane. Not being able to see the difference between holy and unholy. Between clean and unclean. Been there, done that. Brother George, did I ever tell you I was going to have a heavy metal rock and roll group here on the stage one time? I don't like to talk about it, because it was, yeah, I was going to do it. He, no, uh-uh. Yeah, they were praying for me, and it worked, because the day that it was going to happen, I canceled it. Mm. God have mercy on us all. Amen. Leviticus 10, 8. The Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink. Thou then. This was to the priest. Now Jesus was the high priest. Can you, can you stand there and tell me that Jesus made wine to make people drunk at a wedding? No. And no way, no how. And I would say you're probably drunk. If you would think that, there's a spirit. Thou and thy sons with thee when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. Now, God was dead serious about this. You didn't have to worry about being caught by somebody else with alcohol in your breath. God himself would kill you. God himself would do it. Shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may put different. Here's the reason why. The priests were assigned to stand at the gate of the tabernacle, the tabernacle was holy ground, not to be defiled by anything. So families would come and they would bring their offering, things to be sacrificed. It was the job of the Levite priest to examine that offering. If that animal was sick, if that animal was blemished, if that animal was in any way lame, blind, crippled, anything wrong with it, it was to be immediately rejected, not to be brought past the gate entrance into the tabernacle. If they were drunk, 
they would not be able to tell the difference between what was defiled and what was not defiled. Learn to tell the difference. Amen? There's a video clip. An obvious man dressed as a woman, wearing makeup, wearing a wig, wearing a dress, and somebody recording them in a convenience store, and somebody must have said something to the guy about being a guy, and he's going, It's ma'am! It's ma'am! No, it ain't. The, um, the boy that my son went to school with at Hillsboro that wanted to wear a dress to school and dress with the girls in the locker room, go to the girls' bathroom. He and that whole crowd, including the, the uh, minister that was there at that rally, were all drunk, spiritually. They could not put difference between clean and unclean, between holy and unholy, and between male and female. When you can't tell the difference, you're drunk. Amen? Between dif put difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Any congressman who would allow blatant disregard to the laws of our country, spiritually drunk. By the way, uh, Brother Reg Kelly told me this. His family has always been active in Missouri politics. His dad was a Missouri legislature. His brother was one. Now his daughter's one. And he said his brother tried to introduce legislation in Jefferson City, Missouri that would outlaw the use and sale of liquor in the Capitol building. He said, Mike, there are delivery trucks coming in every day bringing in cases of alcohol into the legislature offices in Jefferson City, Missouri. I went, are you kidding me? He said, no. Nope. And he said, my brother's trying to get a bill passed that would outlaw that. Obviously, it didn't go through. But it ought to be outlawed. Do we want drunk congressmen? Do you want a drunk airline pilot flying your plane? Should he be narrow-minded when it comes to landing that plane? Should he be focused, sitting upright, thinking clearly? Absolutely. Okay? So it makes a difference. And he said, if the priests are drunk... They will not know the difference between unholy and holy. So, does it make a difference what music is played in the house of God? Yes! And anybody who knows the Bible can tell the difference. I may not be able to sit here and describe for you every type of music that I think is wrong, but I know it when I hear it. It's like one congressman, or one, yeah, back, way back in the 80s. They were dealing with indecency. Nudity, things like that, selling of magazines. And some, some liberal professor said, show me, show me what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And he said, I may not be able to define it, but I know it when I see it. And 99.99% .99 of all women who walk out of their house dressed in a certain way know what they're wanting to accomplish when they put on what they put on. Am I right? Absolutely. So it's a drunken spirit. There's no doubt about it. Proverbs 31. Turn there. I don't believe that dressing in proper attire is automatic that you're saved and going to heaven. But I will say that if you are saved and going to heaven, you will want to dress properly for the house of God. Can I get an amen on that? Proverbs 31, verse 4, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and do what? Forget the law and pervert the judgment of any 
of the afflicted. Then, let, let me just deal with verse 6 and 7 very quickly, because that's what I was referencing. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. Wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Yes, there are very limited exceptions. Very limited. Uh, the abuse of that takes place a lot. But the idea is, when a person is standing in judgment, when a person has been given the responsibility of leadership and ruling, whether it's a husband over a family, a pastor over a church, legislature over the people, judges who judge the people, presidents and kings, professors and teachers, they should not be drunk physically, should not be drunk spiritually. Isaiah 5.11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that they continue all night till wine inflame them. The harp and the vial and the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. Yes, we can have an exciting service with exciting music and an emotional uh, drama of a message that would pluck the heartstrings and draw an emotional response of people down front to the church. But is it the Spirit of God? And usually the answer is no. I've made this comment before. Can we save people without the Word of God? The answer is no. But can we draw them up forward to the altars without the Word of God? And the answer is yes. We can instill emotional responses in people and make, us, make ourselves think that that's a move of God. I'm not against emotions. But my decision to follow Christ in the spirit that is on me may or may not produce an emotional response in me, but I do expect that it will make a change in me. Somebody say amen. That's what we're looking for. Uh, I won't get into this now. It's time to go. But pray that God, because of your sins, does not turn you over to a drunken, reprobate spirit. Amen. Father, we beg you, don't let us be drunk. Don't let us fall for the spirit of blindness and the spirit of drowsiness, spirit of drunkenness. Father, sober our minds and our hearts and our spirits. Help us to know what we know, believe what we believe, and believe what's right. Help us, dear God, give us the knowledge to accept the things that are true, disregard the things that are false. The devil is constantly, constantly bombarding us with lies, false doctrines, false prophecies, false conspiracies, false news. We're surrounded by it. Help your people, dear God, to base what we believe and what we know upon the Word of God. And Father, we beg you not to turn us over to a reprobate mind. We thank you, dear God, for your love and your mercy on us, for not walking away from us and for sobering, up, sobering us up to the knowledge of your word. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen.